um, you know, so particularly for, for this area on the back of the neck. Um, so you know, see the, where the axe is, but also see where the lines are. I would recognize this spoon anywhere. It looks so good. <laughs> that one looks so good. So this tool is really great. You know, it just worked. You know, it would do wood removal really yes. fast. I'm constantly turning the spoon and, you know, that just having that motion, that really uh, helps. You know, I'll just pull out a couple couple other spoons. I mean, and I will, you know, I will confess that, you know, I am opportunistic. It's like, I made this one a little. Hi, welcome to Rise Up and Carve. Welcome to the Rise Up and Carve Spoon Challenge 35 demonstration. Uh, Michael, Wooden Spoon Fool, is going to um, give us some tips and tricks about the best way to carve his template. So take it away, Michael. All right, well, thanks, thanks so much, Kate. Really appreciate you helping out as host today. Um, really happy that uh, you know, we have Rachel here on hand to do the actual axing demo for us. You know, really happy about that. Thanks to both of you. Um, but I guess first, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the actual shape and, you know, why, you know, this is the shape that, that I end up doing um, sometimes. You know, the pretty much, you know, the vast majority of stuff I do is always going to have some asymmetry to it. Um, It. Um, that's just the way I like to do things. You know, sometimes the bowls are pretty round, pretty symmetrical, but you know, there's always a little bit of sway in the handle. Um, handle. Um, you know, I just that's a style I like. Uh, you know, people have seen my stuff. You know, I like nice, smooth, rounded things. Um, you know, that's also just that's the way, particularly for the you know the cooking serving spoons. You know, that's the, the feel I like to have in my hand. And, um, but this particular shape, the 35 shape, you know, one of the, the reasons I use this, I mean, it's not like I'm some brilliant designer, but, you know, sometimes I'll have a piece of wood. Let me make sure I understand which way we're going here. Yeah, sometimes I've got a piece of wood. And so here, this is actually two-tone, two-tone Madrone, one of, you know, just amazing, amazing wood to work with. Um, you know, we have it, we're blessed to have it here in the Northwest. Um, but to actually get the heartwood sapwood with this stuff is pretty hard. It, it's got to be a pretty big tree. Um, so when you get it, um, you know, you want to make the most of it. And so I like to, you know, something like this. I like, you know, it's not just that the heartwood is really pretty. It's like I want to be able to really highlight um, the contrast. And so this shape, you know, if you can see, you know, this particular piece of wood, you know, I'm going to be able to get two spoons out of it. You know, they're both going to have, um, you know, the contrast, you know, that one, you know, the one, you know, that's got sort of split half and half, you know, I, this is something that really suits my style. It's kind of a little bit of a curve in it, you know, so I want to play that up in the wood. Um, and so, you know, and, you know, sometimes you'll have a piece where, you know, you've just got color, you know, just a thin sliver of color running down one edge. And this template is really good to pick that up. You can just run that handle down that edge and you'll pick it up. Um, I've got a, you know, I've got some spoons we'll look at a little bit later, you know, that, that, um, you know, that, that have that characteristic and the shape, you know, really allows me to be sort of get the optimal, what I consider to be optimal section out of the wood. Um, the other thing I'll talk about is, you know, looking at this piece of wood, you know, uh, being able to get two spoons out of it, you know, I, I use a bandsaw for doing most of my cutting. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's really good about the bandsaw is that, you know, I can actually get both blanks out of this. Um, you know, if you're axing, um, you know, I think you'd have a hard time. You know, I just don't think you're going to be able to ax and get, you know, two spoons out of this piece. Um, you know, so, you know, that is just, you know, part of it, you know, being a little bit more economical with the wood, particularly, you know, I do a lot of figured wood, a lot of special wood. And so you really want to, you know, try to get the most out of them you can. Um, so anyways. So that's sort of the basics um, on why, how, why the shape. Um, now we'll just quickly, you know, my techniques are, you know, I think it's pretty fair to consider them to be unorthodox. Um, 
And we'll Michael, just can I just through. ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. How thick are your, um, you know, we know the length of the blank and then how thick right. are they? Yeah, sure. That's a great question, Kate. Um, so the template, um, you know, we can just look at these. These are, you know, I always vary a little bit. You know, it's like I'm going to vary to sort of highlight what I want, you know, and so, you know, you can change the length of the handle, you can change the size of the bowl, um, you know, so I'm not hard and fast, it's got to be this size. You know, if, you know, other people are doing something where you really want consistency, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not of that nature. But these spoons are about 14 inches long, you know, for my cookings, for my cooking spoons, that's pretty typical to be a 14 inch uh, length. Um, the serving spoons I make tend to be a little bit shorter, like 12 inches. Um, and here, let me pull, pull one out. I think we, yeah, we got that on camera. So this one I measured before coming out here this morning, and it is just, just over 14 inches. It's a lefty. Um, the bowl on these, you got about two and a half inches wide. And, you know, it's hard, you know, exactly where do you measure the bowl length. But it's probably three and a half to four inches, depending on how you measure it. And then... Um, you know, typically, you know, for what I do, you know, the spoons are going to range from, say, sort of an inch in height up to, you know, I can even go up to an inch and a half. Um, but the inch and a half on a cooking spoon, that's really pretty deep. You know, that's really deeper than, than what you need to do. You know, we can look at this one, for instance, you know, we're going to do some work with this in a little bit. But this one is, you know, a lot, um, um, you know, a lot thinner. Um, this one is less than an inch. It's probably closer to, it'll be sort of probably finish up around three quarters of an inch. And, um, you know, and that is fine for, for cooking, you know, moving my veggies around the skillet, you know, you don't really need something deep. Um, I do like making, I, you know, find the deep bowls to be really pretty, really satisfying to look at. Um, but for practical concerns, you don't need to make them that deep at all. So, um, and the handles, I'll just talk about the, on the handle, um, the sizing there. So typically the handles, um, and, you know, excuse me for not being able to rattle off centimeters or millimeters, um, but the, the handles will be about three quarters of an inch thick, you know, where my finger is, um, maybe, you know, up to 0.8 inches, you know, that's pretty typical. And then when you get to the thinnest part of the neck, I mean, this one's not, you know, it's not you know, like this one, you know, the thinnest part of the neck, you know, you're probably talking uh, a little bit more than half an inch, you know, like 0.6 inches, um, you know, that's going to be the thickness. Um, but with certainly with a really hard wood like plum or the madrone or this is maple, you know, you can go thinner, you know, and, you know, like going down, like particularly like the plum, going down a half an inch is no problem. So does that give you a good sense, Kate? Yes, thank you. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, so... That's the size, that's the shape, um, and put that down. And um, yeah, so I think we'll just walk through sort of start to end, um, you know, the different different tools I use. And yeah, and I would say to anyone, um, you know, feel free to raise your hand, pop on, ask questions. Um, you know, if there's anything you want me to go into more detail on, by all means, uh, just go ahead and, uh, you know, dive in. So. But yeah, so it's a little bit hard to see, but I do have a carving table um, right next to me here. Um, here, um, and the way I work it is, you know, I do so I rough cut this shape, you know, so this will be cut out, you know, as you know, just uh, uh, on the bandsaw, it'll be flat on both sides. Uh, something we can talk about a little bit later is, you know, crank. You know, I don't put crank in my cooking spoons. Um, but when I go to carve the bowl, which is what I start with first, I'll put it on the table and I have a little uh, rope loop and that'll go around uh, the neck um, and then out the bottom of the table and I can put my foot in that loop and that will hold the spoon more or less in place, you know, while I'm doing the gouging and, you know, on the, the, the table I'm carving on, I have a couple pegs in it. So the front of a bowl will be up against a couple pegs and it be held in at the neck. And so particularly when I'm going in with the ounce this way, it's not going to go anywhere. And even going back at it the other way, you know, it's still pretty stable. Um, going in from the sides, you're in pretty good shape. Um, but, you know, there, that is, a, you know, an important thing, you know, when you, um, you know, for me, that's, you know, for gouging, you know, that is what I like to do, you know, get it 
are held in place. And so you can get that gouging done, you know, pretty quick. Um, the, you know, the gouges, um, you know, these are standard, um, you know, I use the field gouges. Um, this one's an 818. It just happens to be one that I stumbled on very early in my curving days. Um, you know, if, um, if I were to go back and pick again, you know, and actually did get one, um, I'm still not quite switched over to it completely, but something like a 7, 714, 716, you know, that might be a little bit more um, sort of useful generically. This one, you know, you can go, um, you know, it's definitely good for bigger bowls. You know, um, you know, if you're making small spoons, if you're making eaters, this is not what you want to use for sure. Um, and even for, you know, some of the cooking spoons, you know, this is really pretty big. Um, so one of the things that's really interesting is, you know, from sharpening it, uh, the corners have gotten sort of worn down a little bit, which I really, this one more than the other. And, and then it just comes from, you know, stropping it. Um, but I actually do like that feature instead of having, you know, really sharp angles here. Um, you know, I think that's really good. And then I do think over time with the stropping that I have increased the bevel, um, you know, and it was no intent, um, but the bevel has increased. And I think that does help, you know, when I am doing, you know, the deeper bowls, it, you know, you get a little bit, you know, you can get that deeper bowl, you know, with, you know, just with the gouge, um, just having that little extra angle uh, helps a little bit. Um, so, and, you know, when I do the gouging, um, you know, I am using the mallet um, and um, you can do, particularly if you're using green wood, you know, you can, you don't actually need to use the mallet. Um, you know, you can do it mostly by hand. Um, I find the mallet gives me a little bit more control. Um, and a lot of times when, you know, I do, I, I will, when I get uh, closer to the end, you can go in, you know, just, you know, with your hand, um, and, you know, this does work to, you know, start cleaning up, you know, some of the gouge marks, um, you know, so that is, you know, that is, you know, something I will do. Um, but anyway, so that's, you know, the gouging I do initially. The next thing um, I'm going to do is, um, I forget exactly what, I, I, I call this an open sweep, but I checked on Nick, this is Nick Westerman Blade, um, and I don't think he calls it an open sweep, I think he calls it something else. But after the gouging, you know, you have these little grooves in the spoon. Um, and then I'll go in with this guy and, you know, start cleaning things up. Um, I'll do all, also do a lot of cleanup, um, you know, on the neck up here, you know, get that nice and round. And actually, that I skipped a step. Um, one of the things I do also use is this rounded uh, microplane. Uh, it's got, you can change out the blade. You can get a flat blade for it. This is the rounded one. And with this one, um, I like to go in, it just looks like this tool, the only thing I do with it is work on, you know, that transition out of the bowl onto the neck. Um, you know, I like to make that really nice and smooth. Um, and you can see it here. I think we got a pretty good view there. Um, you know, it's just really rounded, soft curved. Um, so that is a tool. So after I do that, you know, I go in, you know, with the hook knife and work on cleaning up uh, the bowl. So that's, and, you know, I have a couple of different, different hook knives with a smaller, you know, with a smaller spoon, you know, that one's pretty big. Um, this is one from a local Washington knife maker called Drake. Um, you know, they're, you know, pretty inexpensive. And, you know, I got this one, you know, because it's a little bit smaller. Um, you know, if you know Tom from Tom Rusty Rooster 09, big, um, big person in the Seattle Spoon Club scene, um, he teaches classes, among other things, and uh, making hook knives. And so like, this is, for instance, a knife I made in Tom's, Tom's class. Um, and, you know, these are actually pretty low tech. You can make these, it's ground, um, you know, it's ground and then heated up in a mini forge um, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, finished uh, whatever they call it, the process for finishing knife. But, um, you know, these are really nice too. Um, and it's kind of nice to be able to use something you made, made yourself. Um, so then next stage, um, and so I think this is where we get into stuff that's maybe a little less common, um, but I love using my gooseneck um, cabinet scraper. Um, and, you know, I just did just sharpen this guy up and just going in and, you know, cleaning up that bowl, getting it nice and smooth. And you can see, 
you know, you're you're really getting, you know, you're really getting some shavings off of here. Um, and I'll just pull this one out. Um, so this one last night, um, I was working on working on it a little bit, and this is starting to look pretty smooth. And this was all done with a cabinet scraper, you know. So that finish right there, it's just all cabinet scraper. And you know the nice thing, you know, you get these guys, and they can sort of help, sort of get that sort of nice, sort of consistent curve, you know, in the bottom of the bowl. Is you know, that when you the go main shape? The bottom, Is that the main shape that you use for your scrapers, Michael? So I use the scraper on all of them. It's just you know, with this bigger, rounder one, you know, this uh, big, fat, round part of the scraper works really great. You know, with the the template. You know, I would be more more likely to use you know the smaller smaller end of the gooseneck. Okay, so, so you then, use the same kind of shaped scraper for all of yeah. the different spoons. Yeah, with this one, you know, like with this one, you know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to get in there. You can if you, you do a little bit of stuff going across, you know. Um, but really, you know, as you're working on the length, you know, you sort of got to use that um, you know the smaller end of the gooseneck. So, um, but yeah, um, and you know, it doesn't take too long to get that, you know, nice and finished up. Um, and let's see, so after the gooseneck, you know, then, you know, I- Michael, I think we have a, pretty... do you have a question, Marla? Yes, I think to clarify, is that the style of scraper we should, should buy? With that one with the big thing and then one with the little thing. Um it's kind of what Kate Yeah, that's most asking, common. I think. That's it's the gooseneck is really common. A lot of times you get a four pack, you know, with a rectangular, the gooseneck, um, and then a couple ones which have curves, but you know, they're not not this curvy. I did find this one, it's the only other one that I've I've used um through. I think they call it a goose egg, um, egg shape. Um, this one also does work pretty good. Um, I just, you know, gravitated towards the gooseneck. I like it a little bit better, but yeah. Yeah, cabinet scrapers are not too expensive. You just want to make sure you get the, uh, the, the rod, what do they call it, the, the burnishing rod, whatever, the, the rod for sharpening. And it's not too hard to figure out how to sharpen them, but, you know, that is something you want to make sure you, you do have a good, good grasp on. Um, so... Um, here we are. So at that point, you know, like this one, I've got the bowl pretty well smoothed out. And then what I do is I go back to the bandsaw. So normally I don't have one right here, but normally this would still be flat. Um, but what I'll do, the next step is I'll put the bandsaw table at a 45 degree angle and run this through the bandsaw to get rid of a lot of that waste. You know, you know, you can, you know, with the bandsaw at 45 degrees, um, this is, you know, a good operation, you know, that's a great way to use your saw. Um, you're not going to run into problems. Don't, don't, you know, what I don't want to do is like keep the table flat and then try and hold the spoon on an angle. You're setting yourself up for ruining a lot of saw blades that way. It's just, it works most of the time, but if you try to use figured wood or some really hard wood, you'll find, you'll catch at some point, the spoon will snap down and you just put a big kink in your bandsaw blade. So I think it's really important to do this with, you know, the table at a 45 degree angle. Um, and then I also, at that point, will do a little bit of trimming, um, you know, on the handle to, you know, I'm not as, you know, precise when I first cut the blank out. I um, mean, also, you know, I get the round, you know, I get the shape I want, you know, depending on exactly, you know, how things work out, you know, I might have to make a little adjustment or something. Um, but, you know, when I get it back on the band, so I do do some trimming up um, and, you know, we'll just do this one here. So the next step um, I do is to work on the handle. And so I got my round bottom spoke shave here. This is Stanley. I think these are like 35 bucks, you know, nothing super fancy. Um, and I got this used and I haven't even actually even sharpened the blade once. I mean, I don't think it was used a lot, but the blade stays pretty sharp. And I just go at it and I'm going to work these corners down. And this particular piece of wood, it's dogwood, um, and it's it was 
pretty much standing dead. So this is actually pretty dry. Um, this is not green in any sense. Um, but you can see the shavings are coming off there pretty good. And, you know, it's a little bit of work, you know, down at the handle, um, you know, to really get the end of the handle curved. I don't worry about that too much. I can go, always go back in and clean that up with some of the other tools at the end. But, you know, this is where I really am working to make sure I get that little sort of sway, you know, on the handle. And you just go, go over the four sides. And then on the back, you know, you can start to, to work up, you know, where you've got, you know, some of this area where you've got to clean up. Um, but we'll, we'll leave that, put that aside for now. Make sure I got covers and all my knives. Um, Got this guy, got this guy, got this guy. Um, so now we start to get into some of the really unorthodox. Um, so this is one of my, you know, one of the things I really rely on a lot, very, very untraditional, very unorthodox. Um, and really one of the things I do want to point out at this point is that um, a lot of the wood that I work with is dry. When I first started, I only knew about dry wood, um, really hard, really hard to do with knives. So this tool is really great. You know, it just worked. You know, it would do wood removal really fast. Um, I also do a lot with figured woods. You know, with the figured woods, you know, the grain changes are really tough. Uh, you know, the figured woods, it's really hard with the knife. And using this guy, um, it just, it doesn't care about the grain changes. It doesn't get hung up on grain changes. Um, it just, you know, just tears wood off. Um, is it called it a rasp, have... Michael? Is that oh, called a rasp. Yeah, I've got some links and I'm going to post the links um, and we'll make sure those get posted with the video. Um, but it's called a, what is it called again? Um, so it's a Japanese saw rasp. So it's like, you can imagine it's like, you know, six or eight bandsaw blades or six or eight hacksaw blades. Shinto. That are Shinto, Shinto rasp. There it is. Thank you for that, uh, Marla. Uh, yes, yeah, Shinto saw rasp. Um, it's got a coarse and a fine. Um, and I just, you know, find these things, they're just great at wood removal. Um, when I use this, I do put my gloves on. I think Mozzie, I think Mozzie said he's going to send me a new pair of gloves. He was worried about how much duct tape was on there, but, um, you know, using these guys, you know, it's just, you know, they sort of, they, they eat up, they eat up the gloves, but, you know, I just put it in place there, get this thing, and, you know, just, just work through, you know, that hard edge there, and then, you know, work up, you know, on, on both edges. And then, you know, the hard part is, you know, the hard part, you know, where you sort of have to pay the most attention, you know, is in this neck area, um, keeping that, you know, nice and smooth and, you know, not tearing out, not tearing out this too much of this up here, but still, you know, getting enough of the, um, the wood removed, you know, getting a lot of that waste wood carved out. Um, so very unorthodox, but it works great. And, you know, once you sort of get most of that stuff removed, um, you know, this, the finer side, it will, it will put, you know, a pretty consistent finish. And I'll just do this real quick. You know, you do get something where, you know, it's pretty consistent, you know, you, you haven't really like, you know, it's not leaving these deep, deep um, gouges in the wood. And then particularly on the handle, it works best on the handle. It doesn't work so well on the bowl, but I'll go back at it with a cabinet scraper. And, you know, you can clean this up really pretty quick, you know, with a cabinet scraper after running the side of the Shinto along there. And here you, you can, you can probably tell I'm hitting some, like here there was a little bit of a grain change and you sort of got that, that weird, it sort of rippled there. And you know, that's your clue. Like you've got to do that section. You got to, you know, there's a right direction and a wrong direction. So you just got to make sure when you get a rough, rough spot, you just need to go the other direction. And here you can actually just, spend a little bit more time and start cleaning up the end there. Um, and uh, I also say with the Shinto, 
you know, it is, it was harder with the smoke shave to clean this the end up here. Um, and, you know, I'll just go in, you know, with a shinto and, you know, just take off those corners. And then just slowly start, you know, working around getting that to, you know, a nice round shape. So that'll, that'll be, so that'll happen. And then, um, then, you know, this isn't, see what I got here. Yeah, these aren't, none of these are in really sort of, but after, you know, when you're doing the bowl, you know, at a certain point, you know, your Shinto is really digging in. I will switch over to a different tool. This is a Stanley microplane. Um, these are really pretty inexpensive. You can buy replacement blades. But, you know, after I have, you know, most of the bowl, the back of the bowl in shape, I will switch over and do a little bit of, you know, cleanup, you know, with the microplane. And you can see that the, hopefully you can see, you know, the microplane leaves a much smoother surface. You know, it's not digging into the wood like the Shinto. You know, so you, you really got to be, you know, there is a time when you really have to switch from the Shinto to the microplane, you know, because, the, you know, the Shinto, you, you need to leave enough meat there so that you can get those, you can see there where, hopefully you can see that, um, you know, where you've really scratched um, pretty, you know, you have scratched into the wood. And you can see there the microplane, it's just shaved stuff off. Um, so, can you hold it even closer? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, so so there you can see that this scratches from the Shinto. And then here you can see how the microplane is cleaned that up pretty good. Hopefully you can see that. Um, but yeah, so that is, we're getting close to the end here. So um, I'll just show you a couple other Couple other tools I use if I can get my not turning on. Well, it doesn't matter. But I do use, you know, one of these, um, you know, one of these gauges to get the thickness. For some reason, what it's cold this morning doesn't want to turn on. But I do use this to get, you know, general um, thickness. I don't, you know, it's, sometimes it's just like I'm not, you know, I never sit down and say, oh, I need it to be this thick. It's like, you know, it's how heavy is it, um, you know. I want balance in the spoon. Sometimes with really short spoons, it's actually kind of funny. It's like they almost look better with a little bit thicker handle. Um, and then I'll show these as well. Um, so these I made in Tom's knife making class. Let's see, that's the better orientation. Um, so I made these in that knife making class with Tom. Um, they're just, it's pretty simple. It's just, you know, bent wire uh, and then you put a little rivet through it. Um, but I use them to um, you know, just gauge the bowl, how, how thick the bowl is. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, again, you know, I, that's probably pretty good. You know, you know, a little bit more of that is gonna come off, you know, as I sort of finish rounding, rounding the bottom um, inside is pretty good. Um, and then the sanding will take a little bit off. But these gauges, you know, I find them really helpful. Um, and I just you typically measure right there in the middle of the bottom, figure out where the thinnest part is, and then um, you know, we'll go from there. And you know, then at that point, you know, I've got pretty much the shape, and I will switch over. And Rachel, we're going to probably be queuing you up for your demo here in a few minutes, um, so I'll give you a heads up. But then I do uh, switch over to sandpaper. Um, and I'll just briefly talk through the, the sandpaper process. Um, there will be some final shaping I do, you know, particularly, you know, you want to try and get a consistent uniform uh, thickness on the bowl. Um, that takes a little bit of work, you know, it's like, and I just sit there and feel it with my hands. This spot's a little high, you know, take it down with the sandpaper really pretty quick. Um, and here's, here's, a, here's a nicer looking piece of sandpaper. Um, and actually, let me show this. So this actually is the tool that I use when I do the sort of the first sanding. It's called a prepping prepping weapon. And I'll have a link to this that we make sure we get out there with the video. Um, but you put a sheet on it, um, and it's just you know, it's just so much easier to hold this than it is to try to be using you know holding this in your hand. It just gets tiring. 
holding these little squares in your hand. Um, so this is just makes it a lot easier. And going over the back of the bowl, you can pretty much do everything. This is flat, this is curved. You can still pull this off. Um, you can make that angle there. Um, and then just to few things about the sandpaper, not all sandpaper is created equal. I'm really a big fan of this uh, 3M Pro Grade. There we go. 3M Pro Grade. Um, and so when I am doing all the rough sanding, you know, it's at 150. Um, and then when I'm done with the 150, um, what I will do is go through the process of um, 150, 220, 320, 400. And at each step of the way, what I do is it's the raising the grain process. So you, you sand it at that grit level, then you reach out like a little cup next to me with water in it. You wet the spoon, um, then I use a little heat torch um, and I dry the wood off, then go back with that same grit. And what happens is any fibers kind of been loosened in the sanding, you know, they sort of pop up with the water. The water sort of swells the wood, it separates, and then you can go a quick pass with that same grit and shave those off. And you can feel the difference, you know, after you do 150, raise the grain, go back again, you actually notice the difference. Um, but I do that uh, 150, 220, 320, 400. Um, and then uh, typically I do a quick pass with 600 and 800, um, but I don't, um, raise the grain at those levels. And when I am doing the hand sanding, <coughs> you know, I do cut it down to these little squares. Um, you know, it's just, you know, and typically, you know, for a pass, you know, at 220, I'll use one square um, to do all the 220 sanding. 320, I use one square. Um, you know, this stuff really does, it's pretty durable, it lasts pretty well. Um, but that's, you know, that, that for, you know, the size of spoon I'm doing, um, pretty much I can get, uh, you know, one square per grit level. So it's pretty, pretty economical. Um, yeah. And then, you know, after a little sanded, then it's just a walnut oil finish. Um, that's the, the oil I like to use. Um, typically what I'll do is uh, put the oil on and then I immediately put the spoons in a 175 degree oven and, you know, they'll sit there, um, I wipe them off, you know, after 10, 15 minutes, you know, wipe them off some of that excess oil, probably go back in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, give them another wipe. Um, and then probably two, three hours, you know, you can go in, pick those spoons up, they'll really feel dry to the touch. I mean, you know, I, so at that point, you, you pretty much have cured that first coat. And then I'll go back in, do a second, second coat, third coat, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, so um, that's the process in a nutshell. Um, I'll take any questions now, or I think, I think I see Rachel outside ready to do some axing, which hopefully will actually be, be more in line with what the process a lot of people do, but um, any questions or we can move over to Rachel. Thank you, Michael. So is Rachel going to, usually you use the bandsaw, so is she going to show us a technique of axing out your um, shape? Right, so I think the idea is Rachel is gonna, gonna ax out one of the templates. You know, that's, you know, more common for you know, the Rise Up community. So, um, you know, I just want to, want to be really good to, you know, have her do it. It is a little bit of an unusual shape and she's, expert actor and so I thought it'd be really valuable to uh um you know have her give people a look see on how that works and then you know really also looking forward to you know feedback from Rachel on the template and her thoughts you know on you know size and crank I think we you know there's some good things to talk about there so before we go to Rachel does anyone have any questions about Michael's process or process process how many tools do you use Michael yeah, I put, well, I pretty much showed you everything. I do have, I have some other stuff on the table in front of me. I got some, I got some palm gouges. I use these for the eaters I do. Um, you know, for doing eaters like this, I use the, I uh, cut the bowls out with the palm gouges. Um, you know, 
I got my slide. Um, I, you know, I, I am, you know, working on getting better with knives. So like typically when I go to Seattle Spoon Club, I'll sit there with my slide and do some carving with slides. You know, I, I, I do think it's, you know, you know, worthwhile and valuable for me to, you know, have some experience with sort of the more, you know, traditional techniques, um, you know, so I do that. Um, I have one, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, this is a tool, I don't use it very much. It's a curved uh, rasp, um, it's a Japanese tool. I don't use this anymore. Um, like I stopped using it after I got the, uh, started using the cabinet scrapers, but you know, that's pretty much all it. Um, you know, I'll, I will say the, the bandsaw I use, I went back to try and find, you know, actually what model it is. It's a Craftsman and I think it's from the 1950s. So it's, you know, the bandsaw is pretty old technology. It's not anything super fancy. So you don't, don't need a big, huge, you know, fancy anything. You can pull it off with pretty, pretty common tool. But yeah. Thank you. So Rachel, uh, would you like to start showing your axing pro process? Sure, process. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, this is um, quite a big template um, for me. I usually carve eating spoons and my even my cooking spoons are near 12 inches and 14. So it felt like something big. Um, so my first problem was finding wood. Um, and then I had to add in the fact that Michael's spoons are always pretty and uh, finding pretty big wood um, was, was going to be a challenge. Um, but I, I suddenly remembered I had some oak um, lying at the bottom of the yard, just down there. It'd been lying up for six years at least. Um, so uh, I thought I would try that. And so earlier in the week, I, I split up the oak uh, to, to things that were approximately the right size. And that's where we're going to start from today. So I, I split it. It's probably about an inch and a half maybe, slightly less than that, and it's it's long enough. That was all I was caring about. So for me, for the axe work, my first priority is gonna be to, to get that a little curve out of it because as Michael says, his, his spoons don't have any crank. And um, from the outset, that sounds like it's gonna be an easy thing, but of course, it also means that it needs to be flat, um, which is hard in itself to achieve. Um, so I'm gonna, gonna prioritize going flat first before I look at getting the shape onto it. And when you try to get flat, the thing is just to concentrate on where it's not flat. I could see it was down the bottom. I use quite a low chopping block. And the reason I do is because I like to get my head above the axe so I can see where the axe is, but also see where the lines are. It makes it quite nice and easy to get flat. So we've started with getting something relatively nice and flat. Next is to draw the, um, the template onto it. Now, I don't know, can you see the grain on there? It's, um, it's quite striated and that's gonna be really helpful because it's gonna, when, the, when you've got something so big, I'm slightly worried, especially with it being oak, I'm slightly worried about the um, the force that I'm going to need. Sorry, my chopping block is falling over as I'm sitting on it. Shit. Um, the force I'm going to need to carve it. So I want to make sure it's as easy as possible. And if I know the grain direction so visibly, it's going to help it be a little bit easier. So I'm just placing it on there with my trusty little pencil. I'm going to go a little bit big. For one tip, do you remember which side is the right way up on your template? Unless you want a left-handed spoon. So uh, that would be something to remember, just that this template is, has the bowl could be left or right-handed depending on which- Which way you put it. Yeah, which way yeah. you, yep. yeah. I mean, it's definitely a right-handed one the way it's the way it's drawn. So, first thing I'm going to do on this 
put my pencil somewhere or I'm gonna lose it. I'm gonna use a saw for a stop cut. With this shape, I probably can get away without it, but I think it's always, it's always safer uh, to use a, a stop cut. So that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna also cut off the end. Going through this thickness of end grain, I would find quite challenging. So I'm actually gonna cut it at slant and cut off the top there and at the bottom. Um, yeah, so you were asking about end, end grain there. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't sort of worry too much. It is, you know, particularly, you know, that end of the bowl, it's pretty tough, you know, when you're, you know, that is the hardest part to work on, you know, for sanding, for cleaning it up, you know, that end grain at the end of the bowl is, that's really the hardest stuff. Um, you know, um, tangential radial, um, you know, I do them both, you know, I don't have a particular preference. You know, particularly with the figure wood, it's like you take what you get, you know, it's like, you know, I'm typically getting something, you know, that's come, you know, scraps from, you know, a slab guy or something like that. Um, you know, so it's usually pretty, pretty much already set in, um, you know, the orientation. I don't have a lot of choice there most of the time. Um, and, but they, they both work. Okay. So I've cut my um, blank to size and I've put in a stop cut. Now I'm going to, before I split down, I'm gonna thin it down a bit. So Michael said maximum about, well, around about an inch for the bowl and it can thin down. Now, this is quite a chunky hard bit of wood. So I'm gonna be able to thin down the handle, I would say easily to half an inch, um, but I'll start with something slightly bigger than that. So as usual, taking triangles off the side, down. Now I'm going to take some off the off the bowl now but the mistake I made I made one um axe one out yesterday and uh, I realized I made a bit, mis bit of a mistake on the bowl because I'm so used to doing eating spoons with quite a shallow uh, curve towards the tip and when you look at uh, Michael's spoons on his pictures it's it's more like a scoop right the way up towards the tip and then the taper comes down the, the back, exactly. And so I have to really con be conscious to think about that as I'm axing, because it's so different from my norm. Um, so let's hope that I can remember. So I'll come in the sides first, just to... See where I am. So, a bit more of a tight radius. Okay, and now I'm going to come down the side of the drawn line. And I bend it out first just to make it a little bit easier to remove this. Accurately, <laughs> not more accurately. Got to change the template. Sometimes you get lucky. Actually, it split just about where you'd want it to. I wouldn't say that was experience, I'd say that was absolute luck. Try 
looks like it's shifted just slightly across on the template. That'll do me. I don't know whether you saw what happened, but it, it split down the grain, so I've just tilted it slightly. So the handle's not going to be quite as thin. Now, one thing I found is that normally I would press the blank on the other shoulder of the um, of the bowl, but there isn't another shoulder of the bowl on this design, so you need to ax in right from the top and just balance it. Michael, there was a question about using a hair dryer to dry in your pro in, in your process. There we go. Um, so this is a just a Herber Freight cheap uh, heat gun. Um, works works great for this. Um, I think hair dryers will work as well. Um, it was just you know that was not an option. My wife was like, get away from my hair dryer. Um, but yeah, it should work. I would use the hair dryers on the hot setting. It'll be not as hot as a heat gun, but it'll work. I'm really worried about the grain here. It's wanting to go down into the bowl. So I'm going to have to ax it. What feels really like backwards. It's off. Good. So that's the work of the, the band saw or the axe. Um, I'm going to just take off these corners and I'm going to thin out the back of the bowl with the axe because that's far too much material for me to want to deal with with a knife. Okay, that's how I would do the axe work for it. So it's about an inch at the bowl, tapers down a bit more at the handle end. Um, for me, that's a, a that's where I'd normally on an eating spoon move to knives, but uh, I made myself a promise that for cooking spoons, I would always use a, a shave horse or a spoon mule. Um, so that's actually what I did yesterday was go straight from this stage to using the spoon mule. So I can do that if you like, or if you're just happy to get to that stage, that's fine. Thank you, Rachel. That was helpful. Some good reminders about how to keep that top of the bowl thicker than you normally would. 
and yeah <laughs> well done <laughs> choosing the hardest one of the hardest woods um so i uh, would like yeah. to see the safe horse oh yeah Let's of course see. you would <laughs> <laughs> well safe horse comes with quite a lot of swearing Here's one I prepared earlier. Someone has a question of how often do you sharpen your axe? <laughs> um, I think I last sharpened it maybe it's in January. Yeah, I think I was really good in January. I don't do it very often. So my shape or, or my nag as I call it, um, still is in its very much unformed state. So it hasn't got any leather on the uh, grips. So it keeps shooting out, which is why some of the swearing happens. Um, but I'll start with the top. If you want to give me any advice, Georg, I'm very happy to take it. Looks good so far. Hmm? Oh, just a second. Look, looking good so far. I'm sitting on it the right way. <laughs> I've got these very, very uh, cleverly manufactured offcuts of spoon. Um, with my bit of steel. I haven't trimmed it so it catches my hands. Let's bring off. Bring off. I'm enjoying seeing the rays coming through. What draw knife are you using? In, is that bevel up or bevel down, Rachel? Bevel down. Yeah. So the uh, I'm using it that way down. So there's a bevel. Okay, and I'm going to come down this slope. Yesterday when I was doing it, I was really worried about how, how the oak would be on the knife. So I took quite a lot off with the draw knife. But actually, when I carved it today, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't as bad as I expected at least. I carved a lot of oak and I put it in that category of grainy woods it's like the king of grainy woods and you have to um you can really take advantage of carving across the grain it's really easy and then you do a minimal amount of cuts with the grain and then carving yeah. carving grain woods can actually be easier if you exploit that characteristic that carving across the grain is really easy Yeah, the way it oriented itself in the in the um, in the billet, all of the cuts are going really across. You know, obviously down the grain, which is quite nice. That's split on the hand, obviously. And then on the back, I'm going to use the draw knife just to do as much of that end grain cutting as I can.
So that's about where I left it with the draw knife on the back yesterday and then did the rest with the knife. Um, I also used the hook knife on here yesterday. I don't have any gouges. So I just thought I would try a two-handed hook knife approach. Yeah, that looks I really great. My fingers. It's already very recognizable as a wooden spoonful spoon. Yeah, that's quite positive, isn't it? And so you can imagine how that's going to go. Um, so I got, I finished a spoon this morning or this afternoon. And this with the draw knife, a hook, one single hook knife, a slurred knife, and a burnishing tool. I managed to achieve a wooden, wooden spoon tool hooker. Really, it's really great, Rachel. Really good. That looks great. <laughs> looks good, Rachel. So, um, so yeah. So I, I would use another three tools um, to get from here to there. Nice, yeah, really well done. I would recognize this spoon anywhere. It looks so good. <laughs> that one looks so good. Yeah, it should be bumpier there, but we can do with that. Yep, any questions? Anyone else have any questions for Michael or Rachel? It's funny how you still see the Rachel um, handwriting in the Michael spoon. <laughs> That's funny. That is funny. I don't know where it is, but yeah. Yeah. You, see, you see some element in that spoon that still feels like it has Rachel's fingerprints on it, George? Is that what you're saying? Definitely. Oh, I don't. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I, re I really think that, you know, we, we all have, you know, our little style and, you know, I, I can try and make one of Rachel's eating spoons, but it's still going to look like a fool spoon. Um, <laughs> yeah, I brought some, I brought some examples out. Um, like this is, this is pretty close to what I, you know, think of for Rachel's spoon, but you know, it's not a Rachel spoon. That's a Michael spoon. Um, no, you're an extreme case, though. I would not pick that up and go, that's a Rachel spoon. <laughs> no, no, that's not. Um, you know, in terms of the size of the spoons, you know, I'll just talk about it a little bit. You know, this is a cooking spoon uh, or serving spoon that I made. And it just was a smaller piece of wood. And, you know, that really was you know, all I had, um, you know, so you can definitely make these things smaller. Um, you know, they're flexible and it, it, relatively speaking, I think the handle there is a little bit longer. Um, great sticker. Look at that. Great. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'll just pull out a couple, couple other spoons. I mean, and I will, you know, I will confess that, you know, I am opportunistic. It's like, I made this one a little bit bigger and it's like, yeah, I want, I want all that grain and, you know, I want to capture that grain. I really, you know, um, I got to turn off my other, there we go, I'm getting background noise. Um, but yeah, I'll, you know, I will take advantage of the wood um, and if I can make it bigger, Oh, Rachel's Rachel's back in her regular spot, and all and everything seems right with the world. Right, here we go. Um, but yeah, I mean, when we yeah. look at these spoons, it seems like there's a lot of me mechanical stuff involved. But it all there is is just a bandsaw, and if you want to lump the sandpaper in there, otherwise you're just it's all the skill and technique, and you know you've practiced this over and over, like. To get it that smooth, it's just, it's a lot of work. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I don't know, you know, I mean, it's, I'm, I'm going to do it the way I'm going to do it. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say I'm going to change because it'll save me an hour, you know. Um, you know, I think some of the, some of the interesting things where the tools really work in my favor is like getting those handles nice and round, 
you know, particularly that that Shinto saw rasp, it's really amenable to, you know, and so what I'll, I, I turned off my video off the, the phone because I was getting audio problems, but um, it's like when, um, when um, using the rasp, I'm constantly turning the spoon and, you know, that just having that motion, that really helps it, um, you, you know, you're going to work your way towards, you know, having something round, um, you know, so that's, that's another part of the technique, you know, where I wasn't really explicit, um, but that really does help. And then the same thing when I'm, same thing when I'm sanding, I'll be sitting here sanding and it's just a constant, you know, turning, you know, of the spoon, you know, working my way towards that round shape. There are also different grids of rasp. So what really helps me to do the woodworking with the rasp is to get a rasp with a, this, that is much finer than the usual grids. So um, I think there's some general rasp grids, but in some good woodworking shops, you can go get also a rasp which is much finer than the usual thing. And that's um, one of my favorite tools for doing round handles for knives example. Um, so I really like the finer rough. Yeah, this is this is one that I have. It's, this one's actually German, uh, made in Germany. Um, and you're right, there are different grades of rasps. Um, and I forget what I forget, I forget what they're called. Um, I'll use this one um, on the back of the neck sometimes. Um, you know, so particularly for, for this area on the back of the neck. Um, yeah, you know, these rasps work pretty well, um, but yeah, they you know they they're not all rasps were made the same. Um, this one's a particularly nice one. Um, I don't use it as often, but just on that sort of convex section of the neck, you know, it works really great. Yeah, I think I have a Japanese one, um, which is yeah something between a. Um, uh, number one file and a normal rasp. And it's just exactly in, in the middle of that. Great, thanks. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you, Michael. That was great. Uh, does anyone have any question? any more questions? Um, thanks to Rachel for doing the ax work on that <laughs> difficult oak. Pretty hard bit of oak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Rachel, really, really appreciate you helping out with the axing demo. Really appreciate it. Uh, you did a great job. Um, love the spoon. So looks like okay. you're burnishing that one. Can't, yeah. can't wait to see the end result. Still burnishing. I think it'll be a lot of time burnishing in place of sandpaper. All right. Well, spoon challenge 35. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you, Kate.